do and what do you do? What do it's I like do? an interrogation. That's one of the hardest questions people ever ask me. Uh -huh. I consider myself, among other things, and probably most of all, I consider myself someone who cares. Uh -huh. And because I care, I do the things I need to do to try to make this world a better place. And the place where I fit in the best, where I'm really focusing my efforts, is the oceans. Mm -hmm. And there's a really good reason for it. For one, I love the oceans. I'm a water person. I How did that nature. start? Grew up in South Africa, kid on the beach looking at literally humpback whales charging up the coast. Thousands of Cape Gannets pouring into the water, sardines literally bubbled up Cape on our Gannets, stands. Birds? Big birds. Huh. So I got to see nature in its rawest, most vibrant form. Yeah. And then years later, I came, you know, I moved to America, became a diver, and the ocean I came back to was a very different place. We're talking about instead of prolific fish and sharks and everything, dead reefs, hardly any fish around. Loss of marine life on a scale I could never imagine. It just in, in the same, frame. same ocean or harbor, or whatever. different oceans, but oh, all of them in that time frame diminishing in just a few decades, right? Going from bountiful and almost in you could not empty these seas right. to a situation where we've lost 90% of the large fish in the ocean, we've lost almost half our coral reefs, and the situation is getting worse and worse. And I said, you know what. I love this habitat. I love the feeling of connecting in the water. Somebody needs to step up and give a voice to the creatures that have no voice. So this morning I was teaching uh, Elephant Academy where we talk about journalism and ethics and how to change the world for the better, doing similar work to you where you're trying to raise awareness, inspiration to make change, and then saving the planet in a micro or macro kind of way. Um, and I was using you as an example because I've been prepping for this interview. and. Um, it's, uh, you know, I watched your TED talk uh, and even though you're an inspiring guy and there's some really positive things happening, Yao Ming and, you know, shark fin soup is no longer cool yep. in some ways, uh, you're left with a real feeling of heartbreak. So I just want to start with, you know, you in our green room moment, you were saying empathy. Yeah. Um, when you feel that heartbreak, a lot of people want to run, run away from that. And yep. from the Buddhist teachings, you say that's actually the good stuff. That's your basic goodness being awakened. Um, so when we feel heartbreak, what do we do? I think because it's impossible to not feel heartbreak looking yeah. at what's happening to the oceans, right? Yeah. I and mean, if we back up a moment in the yeah. course of my work, yeah, I love the beautiful creatures, but I was so struck by just this senseless destruction, the, the sheer scale and the barbaric nature of how it was being conducted that I felt like I needed to put a spotlight on it. Mm -hmm. I spent about a decade in the dark room, out on the front lines in mafia and triad run headquarters, high seas on shark finning boats, in the markets in Southeast Asia, South America, Africa, documenting some of the most egregious crimes against nature. I mean, is that traumatic? It must be kind of traumatic, right? Yeah. Like you're seeing like those photos, I yeah. think you took them of the dolphins, just bloody concrete cement yeah. and just bunch of dead dolphins. Yeah. I mean, we all love dolphins, right? He doesn't love dolphins. Well, some people, some don't. people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's really traumatic and I won't lie for a long time. I sort of act, played the soldier, uh -huh. which a lot of us do, you know, I got a job to do. Doesn't, I won't let it sink in, but you know, if you look at war, you know, folks who have been through really tough, you know, wars and battles and things like that, they all run into the same thing, which is you can't unsee. It, whatever you do leaves that scar. And at some point, I think it was around 2011, I hit rock bottom. Mm. I mean, I was really dark and depressed. Mm. I wouldn't let anyone use the word hope around me. Mm. I was like, don't say that yeah, word Yeah, because it me. feels insincere, right? It's a joke. Yeah. It's like coming back from some kind of Bosnian crisis that you spent three years in the trenches and then everyone's sitting there drinking Kool-Aid and ice cream and they're saying the world's a great place and you're like, no, it's not. Or even more realistically, you come back to a place like Boulder and people are drinking their cappuccinos yeah. and, you know, uh, throwing away plastic, which, you know, ends up in the oceans. And yet everyone's complaining, you know, first world kind of problems. Like there's no larger, yeah. this is part of the inequality that I see. Like my mom's an amazing teacher. Like some people work so hard to be a benefit. Yeah. And then so many of us are kind of, we're good people, but we're not awake and we're not doing we're not contributing. We're fast asleep. And some people are like, we're driving a Formula One race car fast asleep. Right. I mean, and it's got to be well a ball in the back. I mean, we are cool. racing into the wall. And what we don't realize is the cost of that fuel, where it's coming from. Everyone's like digital age and this age. Yeah. And that. No, it's all the natural resource age. There's natural wealth mm. and derived wealth. Mm. 
The drive wealth is all this and this and the computers and that microphone. That's the stuff we make out of natural wealth. Mm -hmm. Natural wealth is everything that we were given. It's the rainforest, it's the water, it's the sand under your feet. All those things that create the foundation for life that get transformed into all these materials. And when you get so separated, even in Boulder, when we have it in our backyard, when you get so separated from where it comes from, you start imagining that we are in the digital age and we're in this age, and you forget the fact that all of those chips in your phones take, what, six thousands of gallons of water just to even process that single chip in your phone. And that comes from rare elements that are carved out of the Congo by strip mining the trees away, right? We lose touch of the fact that the real wealth, the one that is going to keep this planet going is the one that we are recklessly extracting. And so that's the problem. So in that depth of hopelessness, which I think all of us feel that hopelessness, we're like, we can't save the tigers. We can't save the elephants. We can't save the whales. We can't sure. save the sharks. We can't stop nuclear prolifer pro proliferation. We can't, you know, there's so much we can't. We can't end racial inequality. Like how... Like, we can't even stop school shootings, right? Yeah. Um, and yet you're up there giving talks and stuff. So maybe what is that journey from hope or of hopelessness? Yeah, there's been so many times that the feeling of sort of a deep sense of hypocrisy yeah. has really poured into me where I'm like, what am I saying? Uh -huh. You know, if I pulled back even the curtain slightly, yeah, you don't want to know what's behind that curtain because the darkest dark is – beyond anything anyone can handle. You know, I give the filtered version of yeah. what's dark. So it's really easy for me to say, you know, great speech and then walk away and go. Right. And for a while there, I, I have to be honest with you, I felt incredibly insincere yeah. when I came to talk to people about let's get inspired and let's do something. Yeah. Because I didn't believe it. Well, because you're like, even if 1% of the, so you know you're going to inspire in that TED Talk say. 90% of the people in there are inspired. They look at the photos of the manta rays and, sure. you know, you got on the front page of Yahoo News and this big organization made this big agreement, which yeah. is something that's yeah. significant. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you're like, is anyone actually going to do anything? No, I feel, I think we all feel that hopelessness. Yeah. Not even the people who are out there seeing the traumatic yeah. devastation. So you want to know how I deal with it? Yeah. Have you ever... Drugs, alcohol... Yeah, those would be obvious routes. Those, those <laughs> yeah. are temporary routes. Yeah. Uh, and I think a lot of people, honestly, depression in this field is right. a very common thing. I think yeah. a lot of folks I work with yeah. are undiagnosed, seriously depressed people. Yeah. And I think for a while there, I was really struggling with that because you, I have a saying now that's really important is feel the sting, but don't absorb the poison. Right. Because there's so many things jabbing at you every single day. But if you take that in and let it, rot yeah. inside of you yeah you become toxic yeah and i did that for a long time and then and that creates that sense of hopelessness and well pema children just to bring it back to elephant like buddhist stuff that talks a lot about we talk a lot about sadness is incredibly powerful because it's a cousin of empathy and it's right. heartbreak and through that is you know being woke or yeah, waking yeah. up and changing the world for the better but if you let that sadness calcify into depression in a way you're doing yourself and what you're heartbroken about a disservice yeah um but it's so understandable and easy to do it is, it is kind of hopeless right you know what i think hope is, is a very yeah. loaded word yep for me hope often says something else some other force or some other person's going to fix it right it's the outside theistic. of my control and so if you rely right. on hope right you're letting go of your sense of control of making an impact and so i use the word inspiration instead of hope mm. because inspiration is to breathe in and you breathe in right before you're going to do something. Oh, so good. So you breathe in and get inspired. And the thing that can come from that is action. Yeah. And, and if we all sit around waiting with hope or yeah. hopelessness for someone else to solve it, I'm sorry, Man of Steel isn't around. Batman's not around. <laughs> Spider-Man's not around. Iron Man's waiting not around. Superman, Black right? Panther's not all Waiting for Superman. We have to yeah. be the change we've been waiting for. And that can be done. And in my life, what I realized is if you've ever seen, if you've ever rescued an animal, and if, if someone came up to you, and that, let's say now you've had that animal for another year or so, or whatever time period it is, and it brings so much love and joy to your life, and someone comes up and you say, there's no point in rescuing animals. Right. You would look them in the eye and say, you are absolutely crazy. crazy. You wouldn't even be offended. You'd be like, that's not You're true. insane. That's look crazy. at what this has done, just yeah. even for my life, selfishly, the yeah. joy it's brought. And that really has taken a lot for me, because I realize that for everyone I save, 
get on the other side of the equation. How much does it mean to that that species, that animal, right. that place, and their family, yeah. their family, their community, all the things it means so and the ecosystem. much. Yeah. And the other part of it is so is, even so, you're kind of saying even if you're hopeless, on some level, yeah. doing one little thing is small acts of kindness. Huge. Huge, and it's good for you and. You know, I, I, I've, I'm very spiritual about the work that I do, and I believe yeah. that there is a frequency, and we are all part of one single unity, one organism. And just like the cell might not know it's part of the body, it is part of the body. And what I do to the body affects it, and what happens, it affects me. John Donne, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it, is, it is the natural order, and I think we behave a lot more like cancer cells now. Mm. And cancer cells, the big issue with cancer cells is that they think they're not connected to the system. Uh. They actually don't believe they're connected they're to the system. Little libertarian so they're off doing their own thing, and they start forming and growing and all that, not yeah. the right way. And so a lot of our race has evolved into believing that we are divorced from nature, we're divorced from our communities, we're divorced from these connections. As a result, we act like cancer. People say we're a virus. We're not a virus. Viruses don't destroy their host intentionally because they want a host. They need a host. Cancer does kill its host. Mm. And what we're doing is killing our host, Mother Earth. Mm because we don't understand our connectivity. And that now is where my work is, which is saying, you aren't, it's not nature and you. You are part of nature in a way that you can't even imagine. The oceans, we are of the oceans. The pH of our blood is the same as the pH of the ocean. Literally the same with salinity of the ocean. Hmm. We are literally of water. We're 90 X percent water. And the fact is, if we are killing that system, we are basically putting a noose around a heck deck and we're pulling it ourselves. But at the same time, there's so much joy and beauty in it, and it's hard to go and feel sh guilted and shamed into something. And this is where you pointed to an issue, which is when I feel the, the, the weight of the world and how hopeless it is, what the forces that want to constrain us, the ego, the ego wants to paralyze you. And we have so much information out there in this big stratosphere that's saying, I, 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 ego, ego, ego and not you, don't share, don't be community. All those forces are coming together to say, you're helpless, you're powerless, and the one thing they want you to believe is that you can't make a difference. Mm -hmm. Because then you won't act, and then what happens? If nobody acts, what happens? The whole right. system collapses. So it's almost so refreshing to say, I don't buy into your model. Mm -hmm. That's not my belief system. I believe that every single cell in my system that is operating as healthy as possible creates a healthier system. The vibrational frequency of that healthy cell that healthy atom can permeate the entire system. And what I'm trying to do is say, let's take that one thing, that one piece of joy, or whatever that system is, let's now amplify it. And that's the power of communications. Your readers, I don't know how many millions there are, but yeah. the people that are following it, each of every every single one of them has their community. Yeah. And so that million turns into tens, turns into yeah. hundreds. And whereas before you had to be basically controlled by major newspapers that had the entire publishing world under their thumb. We are all now self-publishers. We can reach into these channels, take those stories, and share them yep. and magnify them. So my mission is to say you're not helpless. You better light, you know, it's far better to light one candle than curse the darkness. Mm. Because if you've ever watched one of those concerts when those lights start lighting up, mm. complete blackness, right? One goes up, another one goes, and eventually, now it's cell phones, but it used to be light lighters. Right. And the entire thing is one glowing candle moving in unison. You, and the entire stadium's lit up. Nobody had to tell that one person that if they lit that, that there was a guarantee that the rest of those things were going to happen. Mm -hmm. Everybody who were around them felt that energy. And somebody was moved to act. And somebody was moved to act. And that's honestly what happened with um, structural slavery in the, in the British Empire. Same type of thing. Civil rights hit a point like that mm -hmm. where, yes, we still have a lot of discrimination, but it's not legal. Right. At least we have a framework now that says you have a right because of your color. Yeah. to still have equal rights. And women could barely vote just a few decades ago, no, which is insane. Yeah. In this country, people forget that. Yeah. So change does happen, sure. but we think in days, weeks, and quarters. We don't think in terms of months, years, and a decade. No, we've seen it with, like you've been pointing out, we've seen it with tobacco or the Me Too movement. We see change happen radically and quickly. We're seeing some of that finally with the school shootings. But... Um, you know, the question is then how to sustain that because we're a 24 hour news cycle. Like yeah. what's interesting last week, you know, no one's talking about Trump and the porn star this week, right? Back in the day, that would be a story for years, Yep. you know, 
So, um, but nature, there's this powerful quote, not to depress you further, but there's this powerful quote about, I think it was the National Forest, and it was like some environmentalist person who was trying to protect this forest, I think it was in Alaska, was saying, we have to win every single battle, and they only have to win one battle, because if they win and they cut down the trees, that's it. So, um, but there are inspiring stories, even with the oceans, obviously, yes. and you know them better than anyone sure yeah so the shark fin thing has been kind of turning a corner right well let's I mean, let's go back a little bit in time commercial yeah. whaling right there was a time where all the great whales were on an absolute certain course of extinction right it wasn't even questioned right. it hit a point where everyone's like yep we're gonna lose them all when was this like turn of the century the 70s 1970s 1980s oh, that, not so late. long ago wow. I mean literally certain extinction for most of the large great whale spe great whale species but then somebody realized a researcher that said, you know what? These animals speak. Mm -hmm. People are like, no, they don't, they're just fish. Right. No, they speak. And they basically recorded the songs of whales. Right. right. And it was the, the song of the whale, the yeah. frequency of that whale that got broadcast around the planet. And suddenly people connected with the whale in a way that they'd never imagined. Instead of the, the monster of the deep, there was right. another being speaking to us. Right. And within a few few short years, Globally, the International Whaling Commission banned all commercial whaling. And that was because of the awareness of them, those songs. I remember I was born in 74, and I remember, you know, all the Save the Whale stuff and also the, the songs. We would listen to them. Yeah. They're hauntingly beautiful, right? And if you had asked someone in 1974, an environmentalist, what were the chances of saving the whales? They would have felt hopeless. They would have said, we're going to try, but how do we turn around literally Russia? Cold War op right. opposition, how do we turn around all these other nations? Right. They would have said it's impossible, but we're going to try. Right. But then somebody came through with something, which is empathy. They created a way that the nature could speak right. to us, and they stirred this empathy that resonated around the entire, entire planet. And within a few short years, it became unconscionable to carry on the practice of commercial whaling. And for the most part, with certain exceptions in Japan and a couple other ones, Norway, maybe Norway a little bit of Iceland, we shut down the vast majority of commercial whaling, and as a result, they're slowly coming back, but you have seen immense recovery of humpback whales where we didn't see them anymore, literally an order of magnitude recovery. So they're doing okay. They're you nothing know. like they were pre-industrial whaling. Right. Let's not get the illusion, but they are now in a point where their populations, if we leave them, will actually recover. Wow. So that was something that we did, and that yeah. was a huge we. That was a planetary move, and that was governments around the world that are driven by Money, short-term profit, right? Pleasing very often greedy constituents. So how do we apply that to climate change or to sharks or to you know? It's the same model. Because we did it with the ozone layer too. I remember late '80s. That was a huge. Yeah. You know that was like climate change. No yeah. people are like we can't solve it. It's getting bigger. The, the, the problem is we forget again and again. Whales were not solved by fear and guilt. Uh -huh. Nobody went around, no one succeeded in the whale movements by saying, you're going to lose it all, you're going to lose it all, guilt, 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 guilt. No, they right. created the underpinnings of why when someone comes to your door and tries to kick it in, take everything you have and murder your family or friends, right? You're not going to let that happen. You're going to put your life on the line to protect that mm -hmm. because you have a connection and right. a relationship and you empathize with that situation. Like with the rescue dog, you were kind of saying, yeah, I wouldn't let anyone attack or kill Someone comes up to my kick dog. your dog? Yeah. Better watch out. Even yeah. if you're a pacifist, you're not going to be that passive, right? <laughs> the same is true with the yeah. environmental movement, and we keep forgetting the lesson that it starts with love. Hate will never overcome hate. Mm -hmm. Fear begets fear. Mm -hmm. And if you move down that track of fear and guilt and all that, people shut down. People withdraw, and yeah. they feel hopeless. But if you basically switch it around and say, you know what, I'm going to make you fall in love. I'm going to connect you with these places. I'm going to connect you with these beings. I'm going to inspire you that you are part of that story. And then in a very small and sharp dose, I'm going to give you a poke. Mm -hmm. Strong medicine in small doses is my philosophy. I'm going to remind you, mm, ow, what was that? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to poison you. I'm not right. going to make you toxic. But you're going to feel the sting just at that moment when you have that love building. Right. And suddenly you're going to leave, no, that's my dog. Don't hurt that animal. It is helpless. That is the formula for protecting everything on this planet, and we keep forgetting that rule and forgetting that rule. Yeah. We have to remember that. So I really recommend we've we've hosted some of your photos and shared them and tweeted them and all that. But 
you know, your photos kind of are that poke. Like when I was watching your TED Talk, it's funny, your TED Talk got more and more inspiring as it went, and I got more and more sad because I was like looking at these photos, yeah, like the shark fins, and you're yeah. saying it's not a 1,000 a day, it's not 10,000 a day, it's not 350,000 a day. Sharks? Yeah. And they're suffocating. Half of them, they just cut off their fins, and they let them bleed to death. And For days, even weeks, and they're oh suffocating. Oh, I just want to hold you underwater for a couple of weeks at a time to yeah. the ground. And those photos, yeah, you know, of the uh, manta rays, the gills, and yeah. the dolphins, like I mentioned. So that's the poke. Yep. That's the heartbreak. You know it's not right. Even if you're a hamburger eating whatever, you look at that, you're like, that ain't right. You um, can't. You, there's no question. It just. Yeah. And part of my imagery, the hard imagery, is not to basically appall you. I don't want you to feel right. that sense of disgust. Right. I want you to feel that sense of injustice like this is this is unconscionable it's it's fascinating in a certain sense almost like fascination with the abomination heart of darkness kind of thing mm -hmm. it, there's something really interesting here and then as you go into the image you realize that that's not just triangles right that's ten thousand shark fins that's yeah. three thousand sharks spread out on that one thing in just one day of drying yeah and you go one day that's one day one day yeah <laughs> wow I was in a facility I've where I've never there was, seen like tacos made on. I saw seven thousand sharks on one factory floor from a single day of landings in front of me. And I said, "Oh my God, is this a big day?" They said, "No, twelve thousand is a big day." Oh my God! Three million sharks in that one port alone. Wow. Yeah, there's another powerful photo which is much more micro, not macro, like that, where the guy is like joyfully smoking a cigarette and holding up a bag with some fins in it. Yeah. I think, and you're like, you look at his sort of casual bravado or joy yeah. and. And you think also about the poverty and, you know, he's trying to pay for his lunch or his family or whatever. He knows not what he does. He switched off. He mm -hmm. doesn't know what he's doing. He's right. switched off. And, right. you know, it's not, it's not necessarily unintentional ignorance. It's sort of willful ignorance, sure. to be honest. And there's a, there's a big dis differentiation. It's not like it's excusable, yeah. but it is understandable. Well, let's talk about the vegan thing for a second, because that's sort of the elephant in the room. Because vegan and vegan people have a reputation for being super strident or guilt trippy. Yeah. Um, but really, it, it is about empathy and about interconnection, uh, interdependence, as you're kind of saying. Absolutely. The John Donne poem, which I love. Every, you know, every island is part of the main. Yep. If you lose a little bit, then I lose too. Um, yeah. So, how do you feel about all that stuff? The whole vegan movement. I think, well, uh, move above. I hate labels. Yeah. People ask me what, what I do, and I, I almost cringe. It's the hardest. Well, because they encourage people to prejudge you, right? Yeah, and it also encourages me to put myself in a box. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, Plant-based diets have such an important role in this, this 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 world because if you look at the amount of land it would take for everybody in the world to eat meat the way just the Americans do. It would take probably two and a half plants worth completely raising everything and turning it into livestock. So that's not a possibility. And if we believe in some form of gas, Mars won't be enough. Mars isn't enough. We yeah. need Mars and the next one, but the next one's made of gas. So it's just for work. cows. Yeah. And dolphins. Just for cows, right? Yeah. So plant based diet becomes an essential element of our thinking as we move to larger population. There's another part which I think is super important is that all of these animals are sentient, all of them have feelings, even fish. Yeah, have feelings, and you've and, seen that because you. Oh, I've seen an anemone. I've seen a Nemo fish. Yeah, that was befriended by a uh, a man, an islander, and for ten years they've been best friends. And it comes out to the reef and kisses him. Yeah, and sits in his hand. Yeah, and we think about oh, it's just a little fish. Even that tiny fish has a very unique personality, has a family, has a life, and has an, has experiences. And we forget that when you put it on a hook and you yank it out and let it suffocate in the deck chop it to pieces and you go oh it's or protein it. yeah it's not protein how would we feel if we went around the world saying oh because you're chinese you're protein right it's completely unacceptable right right well these other animals have a place on this earth and they have a place in the system and like, like i'm not protein yeah it's just eradicating them doesn't yeah. doesn't serve us and so i think plant-based diets is an essential thing not just for our health yeah but for the health of the planet there was this viral gif or video basically on reddit like last month of this uh i think this guy rescued he found a uh, washed up octopus and it was dying it was drying out to death or yeah, yeah. suffocating in the air however that works and he took it and he put it in the water yep. and it you know like loosened up and came back to life and it came back and hugged his foot 
for like a long time and it came back wow. through some rocks like it wasn't a convenient mistake it like came yeah. over and just went i rescued when i rescued that manta ray uh, with entangled in line it just kept coming back to me and back to me and it literally put let me put my hand on its head and rub its head and this is a wild animal that's never ever ever had physical contact with a human and it doesn't know what you are or it's not familiar it doesn't know with, with me in the way that humans think about it right but it knew Right. Well, knew you helped from a from an animal native wisdom standpoint. It yeah. knew exactly what I was. Well, just from a seeing it, like there's another viral video. I'm sure you know all these, but like the whale that gets untangled from the plastic and then it starts and, leaping. And it, yeah, it starts like yeah. celebrating, kind of hanging out by the boat. They yeah. have joy. They have personalities. Yeah. And so I just my belief is, if given the choice, I don't have to have another animal suffer or die for me to to, to survive. That for the overall suffering of the planet is a really good thing because one of the things we haven't recognized is the billions of animals that are being slaughtered and in egregious conditions. I mean, horrific factory farm conditions. If you take global suffering right now on this planet, it is at the highest point it has ever been in history. So you think about civil war, you think about the worst times in history, right? Nothing is as bad if you consider all beings right. and the level of suffering that is being enacted upon those animals right yeah. now and humans we have more slaves ever than before in history right now in other forms of slavery yeah. the amount of global suffering is at a peak other forms and also way bigger populations a smaller percentage but yes but point it, taken but let's just tell you let's put 100 pieces of people in the room and yeah. one piece person in the room and then turn the volume on a screechy soundtrack yeah whether there's one or a hundred in that room yeah. it's just more people being affected by that that frequency yeah. and i believe we're all connected by frequency yeah. That resonation, we wonder why everyone's getting these weird diseases and they're all feeling that tension. The entire planet is oscillating right now in my mind mm -hmm. at a very violent, tragic frequency of suffering and pain if we can reduce that noise. Yeah. Imagine if it's screechy, screechy, and suddenly someone just turns it down. Right. Yeah. The whole, all the cortisol levels in our body are going to be reduced. All the mental disorders, all those things will be reduced. And all the willful ignorance, which takes a lot of like, I'm not going to look, I'm not going to yeah, think about it. I'm going to enjoy my nachos. You know? It's exhausting yeah. to keep pushing back the truth. Yeah. What I say is don't push back the truth. Let it in, sit with it, be present with it, and then make your decision. Mm -hmm. And whether that means you're vegan tomorrow right. or vegetarian or just cutting back or you, one of the industries you just aren't okay with, Start becoming a conscious consumer. And I, I'm vegan. I, I talk a lot about being an intelligent or, or actually like non-hypocritical vegan as much as you can. We're all hypocrites yeah. on some level. Sure. But, you know, supporting these monoculture crops as a vegan or palm oil, you know, that's still wild, wildly irresponsible. So, yeah. you know, vegans who are like I try to bike as well, like try to be a holistic kind of vegan yeah. where you're enjoying the food you eat. It's not self deprivation. Yep. You're thinking about the effect of the food you are eating. Yep. Organic is so many vegans don't give a shite about organic or about vinyl. No mm. on vinyl unless vinyl. Um, Look at the packaging on a lot of organic stuff. Right, exactly. Think about as you said, this be a conscious consumer and yeah. make an informed decision. Yeah. But come from a heart space. Right. Like for example, chocolate. Everyone loves chocolate, right? Yeah. Well, there's eight million children in West Africa enslaved, yeah. not underpaid. Right. Locked in camps right. with their little hands processing the chocolate that goes to all the major chocolate manufacturers. I Could feel you, like I didn't know that somehow. Eight million children, eight million children are enslaved, enslaved to making chocolate. For the big manufacturers. Um, so I love Alter Eco, just to pull us out of that hopeless pit of despair that I'm about <laughs> to fall into. Alter Eco is fair trade. Sure. It's plastic free. It's yeah. organic. Yep. It's a good company. And there are solutions, but it eight means million children. eight million children. I think the video, the this interview is over. I have to go. Like, can you imagine a picture of a mother position. handing that Hershey's bar to her kid, right. kid, right, and realizing the eight million that went into it? So, if it's not fair trade, there's a danger that part of that cocoa is coming from slave labor. Yeah, uh, if it's coming from West Africa, it's almost inevitably. If it's coming from South America or from Southeast Asia, most likely it's not. Okay, that's the heart of all of it. Jesus. But that's 80, 70, something percent of the chocolate. So what I mean to say is, you could get cocoa beans that were put into an organic vegan chocolate from there, right? Right. And you could say, look at me, look at look how good I am. Yeah. But your decision, because you you don't know, and now that you do know, and everyone out there who now knows. 
you now have to make a decision. Are you going to look into your chocolate and decide, right. or are you going to now become blind to the fact that 8 million children have to be enslaved to keep your little taste buds happy? And the cool thing, so I really want to talk about this sort of on a spiritual level. So we all talk about empathy is so important. Yes. But there's a more important step before empathy, which is what I felt watching your video this morning, which is what Buddhists call hot boredom. And it's not as romantic as empathy, sure. but it's what keeps us. You call it willful ignorance. I think it's the same yeah. thing. It was what keeps us from opening up. So we're tired. We have a long day. We've got a lot going on, all of us. And yeah. at the end of the day, we want to sit down and watch a fun movie. Or we can watch Forks Over Knives or some damn thing that's going to like blow yeah. our minds and break our hearts. Yeah. So when I was about to watch your video, I was like, I had this feeling of like, it, like literally in my heart of like, like I don't want to watch it. Like I didn't want to watch it. <laughs> And then literally, and the other night watching 60 Minutes, I had the same yeah. thing. It was the sarin gas attacks on the children in Syria. And there's truckloads of just wide-eyed children being yeah. loaded up. Yeah. Um, and I didn't want to watch it. And I, like, kind of tricked myself into watching it. Like, I just yeah. put it on, but I was going to kind of, like, half watch it and half do full around on my laptop. And within 30 seconds, like, I just got myself in, and then within 30 seconds, I was like, oh, my God, and I put my laptop away and watched it because you can't ignore it. Yeah. But that, how do we get through that hot boredom, or how do we get through that willful ignorance? Because it's not evil. I think you just answered it. Uh-huh. Is what? Well, you, you sit down, you're somehow. tired. You just do it. No, you sit down, you're tired, and the, 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 the burden actually relies on the people who are communicating, not the ones who are receiving right now, because... What's happened right now is you get a choice of entertainment and relaxation because life is feeling stressed. Right. Because our cortisol levels are already elevated. Right. The noise is screeching. Right. We're tired. And if you are more switched on to what's happening, you're already overwhelmed by it, right? You already have that sense of heaviness upon you. Can, you're like, okay, can you – you're sitting there holding the weight. Someone says, can I put two more on the ends? And you're like, legs are shaking. You're like, right. I don't think so, right? Yeah, and it's so, important to take care of ourselves. So – that's why we have to approach this from a different way. If okay. I come in there and say, okay, fast your seatbelt, I'm about to kick your ass again. You're going to be like, no, I yeah. can't do that tonight. Yeah. But if I said, let me, let me share with you a beautiful story. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. that's what you did. That yeah. was cool. Let me share with you a beautiful story, right? right. And, and it's going to be one that it's, it's going to be a real story. It's going to take you on a bit of a journey. And yeah, there's going to be some pieces that you're not going to love. Mm -hmm. You're going to feel this story, right? Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, you're going, oh, I could use that right now. I could use something of substance, but it's nurturing, not draining. I'm not right. going to beat you. I'm not going to guilt and shame you. Right. I'm going to nurture you and feed you, but I'm also going to put some really something of substance in there that's going to help cleanse you a bit, right? Right. That's going to feel good, but we're not doing that. We don't. We keep forgetting that lesson. Whereas the commercial guys that are selling us the Coca Cola and the, they know exactly how to get you. <laughs> they know exactly how to get you. <laughs> They're speaking to you. You're immediate. Right. So we have to look at our packaging and delivery in a huge way. And you did that in, so you did the, so maybe tell everyone about, so you had like a week or three weeks or whatever to educate this yeah. international body on what the hell manta rays are. No one knew or care. And if you don't know, you can't care. So how did you, did yeah. you guilt trip people? Did you hammer <laughs> them? Did you stress them out? What did you do? So imagine a four year pro project, a global project, including 80 of the top researchers around the world to make a proof basically create a, a, a document and supporting data and all this thing that we had a case that said this animal is important. It's racing towards extinction and we're driving it. And the body that we're talking about is CITES, the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. It's the only regulatory body in the world that can protect species, species at a global level, about 184 or so member nations, which is a lot of the world. Mm. And so we- How many countries are there? 230 something right so it's like it's a vast majority 80 percent of the countries yeah so. yeah yeah and there's a lot of tiny little countries that aren't part of it okay all the big ones are and so we have a four-year project and then we're about ready to take this animal and it's ready to get the main stage and then a few weeks before the convention i realized oh my god nobody knows what a manta ray is right and then the ones who have heard of it think it's this stingray that killed steve Irwin. right really bad timing right right who wants to save the killer ray Right. Screwed. Four years gone, the species done. Right. And it suddenly struck me, you know what? I need people to fall in love very quickly, and I can't take them all diving. Right. Because it's one of the most intelligent, connected, gentle animals in the world. It's just, you know, up to like 15, 18 feet across, and it, it rubs its wing on your face, and it's intelligent. And So I said, I need to make a, a story that 
anybody in the world who has no interest in conservation, no interest in even natural history is going to be interested. So um, I work with this woman, amazing woman, Hannah Fraser, Hannah Mermaid, top underwater performer in the world. And we got together and said, let's do a story about a, a love affair and a dance underneath the bottom of the ocean with this animal. But it's got to be any. Oh, the lady in those photographs is that lady? Yeah. Oh, okay. And she's amazing. And I was and wondering how she uh, will. Top right. underwater. I'll let you get to it. Huge environmentalist. She was at the cove. She was fighting for the yeah. dolphins. Strong, powerful woman. So we went down to Hawaii, and for five nights straight, for three to four hours at a time, she sat on the bottom of the ocean in 72 degree weather with very little on except these old gypsy outfit. And we did this entire dance with these amazing manta rays right at the bottom of the ocean, filmed it with a black background. So she was dancing underwater in these No floors. mask, no yeah. regulator. We bring her air every two minutes, hypothermic every night for five nights straight. Literally, we had to put her in a hot tub for three hours to bring her body temperature. Oh, my gosh. So you're really? talking about... So she was shivering. And beyond shivering. She after was, the first 10 minutes. Oh, something. yeah, yeah. She was deeply hy hypothermic for five nights straight. Like, How did she even... Well, for the next two weeks afterwards, she was deathly ill. Oh, okay. But she cares so much about these animals, she was willing to put it on the line to save them. So on the airplane black, I edited this film, sat down with Louie when I got back to Boulder. So she's dancing around with the manta rays yep. underwater. It's beautiful. Connecting, but we got to put a film and deliver it. Flew back, edited it on an airplane straight, straight through the night, called Louie at Louie Sahoyas. Yeah, Louie was just on the show. We'll put the link in yeah. the uh, comments. Amazing Academy Award winning director. The Cove. Cove, Racing, Racing Extension. Extension. And the new, the Game Changers. Oops. Game Changers, yeah. all about plant-based. And he sat down with me for a couple of hours, and he said, here's the things I've changed. I said, let's do it. And was it good suggestions? Great suggestions. It was just like great at that stuff. I pinged Wired Magazine, New York Times. They said, give it to us. Wired did a huge feature on it. New York Times ran it. Washington Post picked it up. And then suddenly it went all around the planet. And the week before the conference, Jakarta Post, Bali Times, Das Bild in Germany, Russia, this front you page. Had one news. week to go before one the week. conference. It was like literally one of those movies where everything's coming together. It's like the real Mission Impossible. Mission Impossible. You're like, what if I said you had to jump underwater and you had to swim and unlock the thing and then you're, you know, but it's actually it. matters. It it's happened. not a movie. This is species on the line. Yeah. And it went all over the planet. And suddenly, as we walked into that room the first day in the conference, everybody was talking about these gentle manta rays that were under attack and how incredible they were. Really? It was like it was, separate from you, just on their own. They were talking about it. So then we held a, we held a reception. And yet the manta rays never thanked this man. Never Nothing. Thanked. No party. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but we held a reception we showed the film to 300 delegates literally most of the delegates at the convention on the floor they were in tears really we were talking about hardened bureaucrats yeah. are basically talking about looking at the financial interests of their country right very little science or any tourism interest in these animals suddenly reduced to tears because it spoke to their heart well that's a huge subtle point is Ecotourism can save the monarch butterfly, maybe, or it can save the sure. elephant. Or, but for manta rays, it's harder. It's harder because you, you have, have to go in the ocean. Right. I mean, there's an argument, but it's still like they're all over the place, right? Yeah. So we we showed it, and then throughout the week, you had nations like Japan and China literally showing up with briefcases of money, buying boats, unashamedly walking around the floor with brief, briefcases of money. And I watched as they would wait. Go who? Up. Japan and China? Yeah. Because they like to hunt the manta they ray. They don't believe their historical stance has been that you do not protect these rain species because we're going to eat them. They eat manta ray? So manta ray gills, they take the entire manta ray, this giant one-ton animal. huge, right? Bigger than this room. 15, 18, feet, 15 18 yeah. feet across. Stick a spear in it, kill it, cut the gills out, throw the rest of the animal away because it's rancid meat usually by the time it gets You can't back. eat the rest? You could, but it's really not good. Uh -huh. Very few people eat it. The gills then get dried down to a few kilos wow. and they get sold in China as part of a soup. Yeah. With seahorses and pipefish. So I call it an extinction soup. And it's meant to fix ch chicken pox and fever. Right. It doesn't work. Right. But it's driving the extinction. It's like the, the rhino horn stuff. It's the rhino horn. It's tiger the bone. gallbladder. It's tiger bone. It's all the BS that's surrounding the, the bear bile. Yeah. Just fill in the blank, right? Yeah. So we showed it. People got inspired. And then despite me sitting there in tears watching as the buying of the boat started to happen, after they would leave the room, I, one of the guys from West Africa came up and he put his arm around me and said, don't worry, man. Your mentors are safe with me. Oh. And then we went into the boat. And I'm sitting there, and then China says, we want to call a silent vote. And what they've done in the past is they've everyone knows who you are, that yeah. you're behind all this. They know I'm involved Mantra. heavily in this. Yeah. yeah, I'm not the only one. There's a great community. We had great organizations, Mantra Trust, Wild Aid, you name them, all working. But 
my part was a very specific piece of it. Right. And I just remember watching as the vote was being held and, and they called a silent vote because China's strategy was buy all the votes okay. because you don't know who voted. And against silent them. removes the shame, shame, so it's easier to... And then as you watch, you look at it and the red bar started going up and I was like... Wait, what's red bad? Red is against. Uh -huh. and I'm like, no, no, no. And then 80%. Land, one of the biggest victories for a marine species ever. Wow. And the room, it's usually a very solemn, silent room. The whole room erupted in cheers. Oh. And the, the person's hitting the, it's like one of those courtroom scenes. They're hitting the gavel, silence in the room. Silence. And then one by one, the nation said, I know this was a silent vote, but I want my vote to be registered. We will not stand by. And then you just saw the room. It was like one of those films again where everyone started standing up. Oh. And I just realized in that moment that you can beat greed. You can greet, beat apathy. You can beat all of the things that we say are the barriers to conservation and change by just connecting people's hearts to do yeah. the right thing. Yeah, That's yeah. empathy. Amen. So let's do that. And I believe if that's our philosophy and we let go of the anger and hate, hate does not overcome hate. Right. It takes love and, and love not in a hippie sense of love, but the way you love your family, your friend, your dog, your pet, and you should learn to love yourself. Yeah. If you can extend that out a little bit further each time. Yeah. A little bit further, a little bit further. Yeah. You can make that difference. Well, that's one thing I loved you said in your TED Talk, like, you were frustrated that you felt like you were reaching the choir all the time. And that's literally our mission is to reach beyond the choir to all yeah. those who might give a care. That's our mission. Have to. Um, and we're lucky to be able to do that. And you're lucky to do that on a huge, huge uh, scale. So, you know, just encouragement, if anyone is inspired, share this, share this um, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, but share it, try to share it with people who maybe haven't thought about it or don't care. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's not just about mantas or oceans. It's right. like, stand for something. Right. Something that matters and, and protect the vulnerable. And whether you're looking out for, in, you know, at-risk children or right. you know, land being consumed around your, your property or right. a bald eagle, I don't care what it is, right? Right. If each person finds their thing yeah. and extends some empathy and then stands for it, we would have an entirely different issue. It would be basically how do we channel those forces of change Right now, we're desperately trying to recruit them. We could switch it around because inevitably, there's going to be a huge overlap between some people that also love bald eagles, right? And you're going to form legions of people standing for nature yeah. and standing to protect our natural wealth. Yeah, it's like the Avengers, but real yeah. world. You have the manta ray protector and the yeah. you know, plastic fighter and the <laughs> uh, you know, organic, organic farmer. You know, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much for your work and for not letting the depression claim you because we need you and we need everyone. Yes, we do. Um, and uh, yeah, I felt like 90% of today was just straight up Buddhism in action. So Hugely. obviously Buddhism doesn't own any of that. It's just a universal thing. So thank you so much all of us. for your work. Good man, Big Sean love. Heinrichs. Thank you, guys. Thank you. If you love this, give it a like or a love. Funny face to Modicon. Thank you, as always, to our sponsor, Aspiration who is awesome, and I should have mentioned them up top. Uh, they're doing good with our money instead of bad. And, um, yeah, give this guy some love. Let's give it a minute. Um, is And how do people find your website and all that stuff? How well, do people join in and help you, maybe donate, whatever? I think the big thing is I was able recently, with the help of a, some really great community, to expand my work, and now I have a foundation. Cool. Which is the amplifier, and that's the bluespherefoundation.org. Right. Bluespherefoundation.org. Cool. Yeah, we just tweeted you guys last night. So uh, that's in the comments. Yeah, so you can find them there. All right, thank you everyone for thank watching. You. Without you, there's no point. Just two guys in a room. Good man.